Okay, quick video, here we go. Absent-minded consumption is bad and shouldn't exist because having an entire market segment for swindling large amounts of money from a consumer by taking frequent small bits over time is a form of extortion. All right, end of video. Sure, I joke, but I'd like to preface this video by saying that just because a behavior in capitalism exists that we don't like doesn't give us a free pass not to analyze it. Absent-minded consumption is an easy target of hate for young anti-capitalists because they're growing up in a world full of boomers who reinforce their intense financial anxieties. There's the penny pinchers who are frugal in a way which makes young people perceive small, dubious purchases as universally bad, and the easy spenders who used a lot of their money on temporary things like eating out and road trips, fun things which young people have been taught they're not allowed to afford because poor people aren't supposed to have fun. The spending habits of the elder generations, no matter if they were fiscal or flush, seem to always be interpreted by younger generations as an example that absent-minded consumption is always a bad thing. But what actually is absent-minded consumption? For the sake of this video, I'd consider absent-minded consumption as a type of transaction made with little thought and little money. Notice, though, that my definition doesn't make a determination about value, because that's not entirely dependent on the type of transaction, but rather the context. And context is that changing cultural factor of absent-minded consumption that I want to focus on. I'd argue that the most popular forms of absent-minded consumption during the boomer era, and even as recent as a couple of decades ago, were done in a social context. When the internet wasn't as omnipresent as it is today, and when America had some semblance of functioning third spaces, absent-minded consumption was done relative to a social function. You'd be going out to eat because you'd be spending so much time with your friends that lunch rolls around and you want to keep the interaction going. Maybe you're out with some friends from grade school and you all pool together money for a pizza to share. Or maybe you're walking around a mall, library, or other public space and get something at a vending machine. Yes, these examples are food-based. This will be an important detail later. Anyways, these absent-minded transactions had value because they enhanced the social context they were done within, and were so cheap that you didn't need to think too much about the quality of the product or whether the purchase was worth it. Obviously, that's not how things are nowadays, and the way I was reminded of this change shocked me enough to inspire writing this video. I was re-watching a YouTube series I liked when I was a kid called Is It A Good Idea To Microwave This? And in one of their earlier episodes, made in late 2007, they were microwaving a mini chip bag. Near the end of the video, the host, Jory, offhandedly mentions that the small chip bag they microwaved was 25 cents. So small 25 cent bags probably not such a good idea. When I heard that, I, I had to pause the video. Those chip bags used to be a quarter? Nowadays, they're between $1.25 and $1.75, depending on what vending machine you get them from. That's up to seven times the cost in the 16 years that have passed. Only a fraction of that is due to inflation, since $0.25 in 2007 is the equivalent of $0.35 cents today in 2024, accounting for roughly 1 14th of the 700% increase. This change in cost completely obliterates the function that chip bag once served in American economic culture. When you were buying a snack bag of Cool Ranch Doritos, the superior flavor, fight me, the fact that it only contained a number of chips you could easily count on one hand didn't matter because it was so damn cheap. The same problem is affecting the cost of fast food, too. As menu prices are outpacing the rate of inflation, that aspect of absent-minded consumption has also been obliterated. When a simple burger or chicken sandwich was only a couple of bucks, you probably weren't likely to complain if the buns were off-center or if they forgot the pickles and mayo. But now? Why risk it? Especially considering worker wages aren't increasing nearly as quickly as the cost of these things, people aren't eating out as much, with younger people especially being less likely to pay extra for the convenience of fast food compared to a similarly priced sit-down meal. These behaviors reflect in market data, as according to Content Science Review, 61% of Gen Zers would pay more for quality compared to only 50% willing to pay more for convenience. Getting back to the rising costs, they destroy old forms of absent-minded consumption not just because of affordability, but because it's no longer absent-minded consumption if you have to think about the cost. You're not inclined to visit the vending machine anymore if you have to take a moment to consider if a small bag of chips is really worth almost two dollars. Fast food runs similarly aren't fun anymore if you're having to always split the bill, bring coupons, or figure out which mix-and-match meal deals will keep your quick lunch under five bucks. These things used to be fun because their cheapness meant you didn't have to think. It's the poison that ruins the fun, anxiety-free nature of absent-minded consumption. Cool story, but if that's the case, then why didn't I title this video Blah Blah The Death of Some Bullshit? Well, it's because absent-minded consumption still exists in the present day, but in a radically different form due to shifting social factors and consumer priorities. 
Nowadays, we lack the social context that previous forms of absent-minded consumption existed in, and consumer priorities have started to measure the worth of such consumption in terms of how long the product lasts instead of how much emotional worth it might generate. This is because younger generations are now more likely to think of purchases as costing an amount of labor hours instead of a simple dollar amount. In their minds, that fast food meal didn't cost 20 bucks, but instead roughly two hours of their labor. I should clarify that this isn't always an inappropriate way to think about one's spending, but it can become unhealthy if taken to the extreme. I've caught myself thinking in the same way when considering social absent-minded consumption, wondering if eating out with friends is really worth multiple hours of my labor for something that will last an hour, especially when that can be spent on a video game or vinyl record. Mmm, vinyl. Either of which will last immensely longer than eating out. When we justify the cost of something by measuring whether the hours enjoyed outpaces the hours worked to afford the product, we're ignoring the other factor that decides the worth of such consumption, emotional value. Time is an objective factor that can be measured, meanwhile emotional value is a subjective factor that's hard to make judgments about. Especially with absent-minded consumption, the thinking required to make that calculation is seen as a nuisance, and thus ignored. With all of this said, what do modern forms of absent-minded consumption look like? I'd say it's characterized by three main factors. One, it tends not to be consumable products like food or snacks because those immediately fail the litmus test of time to justify the purchase. Number two, it is primarily done on the internet because the inconvenience of going somewhere to buy something is seen as a convenience barrier. And lastly, it takes advantage of socioeconomic insecurities felt as a result of modern economic turmoil. I think the two biggest examples are digital products and something I like to call lesser goods. Starting with the latter, a lesser good is a kind of product that is trying to pass itself off as being fully legitimate despite having some kind of drawback like poor build quality, horrible worker standards, or flat out false advertising. Lewis Rossman actually covered a great example of a lesser product in a video he made about Amazon and how the wire crimps he bought from them straight up didn't work compared to their functioning, legitimate counterpart that could be ordered from a local hardware store. These lesser goods are being legitimized in the online market because they're shown next to reputable name brands or are the only option provided in some product categories by trusted online retailers since legitimate companies have all left the platform due to their unfair business practices. Obviously, if all lesser goods were completely dysfunctional, that market segment wouldn't survive for very long. So their bread and butter tends to be towing the line between an actually functional product and a blatant scam. If it isn't a dysfunctional product from a no-name company on Amazon, then it's usually a half-baked product on websites like Wish or Timu. Wish and Timu exploit the inadequacy felt by poorly paid American workers who don't have the same liberty of purchasing power they did before greedflation started ramping up. These websites enable the fantasy of purchasing power by dressing up their products to make people feel like they can still afford to buy nice things, like wireless earbuds, RGB gaming peripherals, cute clothing, quaint accessories, and even computer parts. The websites that provide these products have an upper hand on the consumer because the types of people who are interested in this low-hanging fruit don't have experience with legitimate products across diverse market categories, and this very well might be their first time buying such products, so it's hard for these consumers to call out how poorly they're made. Young people think they've gotten a one-up on the social consumables of old by purchasing an RGB gamer mouse from Wish that will last them weeks, maybe even months, if it doesn't break down. But these things don't deliver a lot of emotional fulfillment because they're almost exclusively enjoyed in an individual context, not a social one, and perform poorly compared to a similar product you could get from a local brick and mortar store. Granted, it's more expensive there due to paying for their higher overhead to keep the lights on, but you get the idea. In truth, this type of modern absent-minded consumption isn't selling you a product so much as it is a fantasy. The fantasy that you still have ample purchasing power, the ability to afford good taste, and the wits to find a good deal. In reality, you've surrounded yourself with garbage that you paid China to get rid of that breaks down, doesn't function, and is made in horrendous labor conditions. You have immersed yourself in a lie that you were coaxed into with low costs, quick sales, and less than truthful advertising. The other form of absent-minded consumption that I mentioned earlier is digital goods, and by digital goods I'm mostly referring to things such as video game cosmetics where the actual worth is completely controlled by the seller since it can only be used within their game or application. Unlike lesser goods, this type of absent-minded consumption tends to be enjoyed in a social context. But don't be fooled, we're not talking about the same type of context older forms of absent-minded consumption were enjoyed in, which were as a complement to already existing social activity. These products are used socially as a way to bully people who haven't bought in yet, as is infamously the case with Fortnite. So when they eventually give in, they're rewarded with the privilege of dunking on the lesser group who are the subject of the bullying. This is not something you buy while out with friends having a good time. This is simply a flex. Similar to lesser goods, the people who buy into this form of absent-minded consumption are being sold a fantasy. 
Spendy in-game cosmetics have become the modern suit in Rolex, and the people who buy into this are sold the fantasy that, despite not having the money for real-life high fashion, they can instead get a similar feeling from virtual high fashion. And don't even get me started on augmented reality clothing, holy fuck. It also doesn't help that, like fashion in the real world, a lot of virtual cosmetics are sold for limited periods of time to pressure people into buying with little thought since they feel rushed and are afraid of missing out. In short, our old ways of absent-minded consumption were social enhancers. They were dirt cheap, and despite being of poor quality, served their purpose as something that provided emotional value despite their quick lifespans. Today's absent-minded consumption is about selling a fantasy to a population of people who don't want to be reminded of what has been stolen from them every time they open up their wallets. Now, before boomers start getting on their high horses, I'd also like to note that just because our current forms of absent-minded consumption carry with them depressing emotional baggage, that doesn't mean its old forms are without moral qualms. Encouraging consumption for the sake of consumption, while relying on low-cost, misinfo, or personal inadequacies to push what is, at the end of the day, a low-quality product, is still wasteful and a form of exploitation. While I might see old forms of absent-minded consumption as preferable to what we have now, partially due to my nostalgia bias, it would be preferable if we didn't live in a world that depends on a system of absent-minded consumption as a form of social glue and economic growth. Meaningless consumption is a solution looking for a problem in an economy whose favorite businesses are as close to scams as they can get away with.